Hej allihopa och välkommen till Pengaflöde-podcasten. Mitt namn är Emily. Och mitt namn är Anna. Vi håller på med fastighetsinvesteringar i Storbritannien. Och den här podden kommer handla om just detta och vi kommer varje vecka att ta upp relevanta ämnen och intervjua personer som vi finner inspirerande. Hej och välkommen till Pengaflöde-podcasten. Och idag har vi... What's your name? This is Natasha. <laughs> It is indeed. Hello, how are you doing? I'm fine, and you? How is New York? It's good, it's hot. We're getting humid at the moment. It's, uh, it's nice, we're coming into summer, finally. It seems like Europe has had a really nice start to the summer and we've been so cold up until about the last week, so it's nice out. How many, can you say in... Uh, Celsius? How many Celsius is it? <laughs> yeah, we're at about 24 <laughs> at the moment. 24 degrees. I don't work in Fahrenheit, so don't worry, I can't tell you it in Fahrenheit. Okay, okay. I just started to learn the AM, PM. <laughs> 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 I always used to use the normal clock, but since investing in UK, I'd be like, okay, I need to learn this stuff. I need to learn this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So tell us about your background, Natasha, because you have a very interesting background. I used, I'm listening to your podcast. That's how I found you. And I appreciate that you jumped on. No problem. So my background is that I started off my property career back when I was in my third year of university and I was a letting agent and the reason I had to be a letting agent was actually because I had a lot of debt to pay off from being at university so in my third year I moved my classes around so that I could work for an, a letting agent four days a week and through that coincidentally I found I met a surveyor who introduced me to the world of surveying through babysitting his children. Very bizarre, but I needed the money, so I said, yes, I'll babysit your children. And he said to me, Natasha, I actually think you'd make a very good surveyor. Do you want me to introduce you to a chap I know who runs a surveying firm in London? He's looking for a graduate surveyor. So I said, yes, I would love that because I had no other options. We were just coming out of the recession, the last recession when that was happening. And I've been applying for job after job after job. And I wasn't getting anywhere for my for a graduate scheme. And this came up and I went to the interview and um, the chap that I interviewed with said, okay, you seem like you've got a good amount of common sense. You seem like you're up for the challenge do you want to come to London as a graduate surveyor? So yes, I was like, yes, I've got a job. Once I finish university, I'm going to London. I went to London and the job role was property manager, which I didn't really know too much about, but I was in at the deep end and I went through training for the first three months. But then the chap that was training me, so my line manager actually left. And I got his role after three months on the job and being a complete novice. And so I turned, I was given the job of asset manager and head of property management for this small firm. And I was running huge portfolios in southwest London. I was running an NHS portfolio of commercial and a little bit of residential. I was the commercial property manager for the Sloan Stanley Estates, so running their whole commercial property portfolio. I was doing it for other smaller estates as well, and it was very sink or swim. And then we fast forward about 18 months, and one of my clients said to me, Natasha, you really need to start investing in your own property portfolio. You do it for all of us as your clients, but the same principle applies. All you've got to do is find somewhere where you can get the deposit from. And so that was my first in that was my first kind of forage into the property investment world. And so I was really naive. I was 22. I didn't know any better. So I went out and thought, okay, well. I'll buy a property in London. Why not? And so I started looking at all of these really 
prestigious places. You know, I wanted in the West London or Southwest London, you know, the really nice areas because that was where I was working. I was fortunate enough to be living in Fulham at the time. So that was all I was seeing. And I stumbled across this top floor flat in Notting Hill. And the um, I actually bought it off a Swedish man who was moving back to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who was moving back to Sweden after finishing at university. And he said he would sell it to me for two hundred thousand pounds, which you could never get that in London nowadays. So no. <laughs> I put I I then was like, okay, well I've got this flat. Look at how great it looks. Okay, how do I get the deposit? And so I put a business plan together and my parents, who had never invested in anything, said, oh, actually, we'll lend you the money, but you have to pay us back. But it looks like you've thought this through, you've got people on your team. So I had obviously the mentors and my clients who already had experience of buying these massive portfolios. And I bought this top floor flat and rented it out. And that was my very first experience of becoming a property investor and that was that was me going in naively I didn't really know anything about property investing all I knew was how to manage property portfolios and help my clients achieve their goals through uh, strategies around leases uh, maximizing asset value so I did know how to be a property investor but it was I was looking at it from two different points of view so then I decided to go on and become a surveyor. So whilst I was working for this firm, I was doing my master's in the evening in surveying through the University College of Estate Management. And I was also studying to be a surveyor. And so I was doing all of that all at once and working really, really hard to... Um, I was working really, really hard to become a surveyor, a really great property professional. And two years later, I'd not really thought about what I whether I was going to expand my pro property portfolio I'd been 22 when I bought my first property I was now at 24 and still living the high life in London but studying working <laughs> full time <laughs> and my fixed term came to an end on the property that I bought in Notting Hill and the revaluation was 320,000 pounds and I took nine two years. <laughs> two years. Wow. <laughs> and so I took the money out of that property and repaid my parents. <laughs> and that was when I realized, oh my gosh, you have to do this. This is this is what's gonna be your kind of side hustle. So that was when I really started to fall in love with property investing. I then uh, bought my second property, which was a beautiful uh, grade two listed apartment in the center of Bath. I grew up in Bath in the west of England. And then I started having to play around with all of these properties. And, and really, I caught the bug from it at that point around 2015. When I had, when I had first invested in 2011, it was kind of, wow, that was a fluke. And then I thought, no, I can do this professionally. And then from there, um, I continued uh, growing up, my, growing my contacts, looking at properties to invest in, doing small deals so like pro project management or small flips or joint ventures with um, other people, as well as head being the head of asset management for this firm. And then come 2016, I was like, no, I have to now go and start my own firm because what I've been doing was just absolutely you know, it's too much. I was doing so many things and I was experiencing burnout and I thought I'm going to do this for myself. And so that was when I opened up my, my firm of surveyors, NC Real Estate, which is the firm that I run now. And I also got a really awesome lecturing role back at my old university, the University College of Estate Management. And they took me on to teach the property management modules. So, wow. so I've kind of had this um, which is where I am now. And for everybody listening, I although I'm based in New York, because that's where my husband is, everything I do is in the UK. So my investment properties, well, I've got a development in the US now, but my investment properties, my, I still teach remotely for the university in the UK. And my firm of surveyors is a UK based firm. I have just over the last 18 months moved that all online. So that is my background story to how I've got to where I am today.
Wow. See, I just love the one when you you just flipped it from two years, from <laughs> years from 200 to 380 or what it was. Like anything. Thing. <laughs> Nothing. That was crazy. N nothing but that was the time when after the recession we went through a bit of a boom period up yeah until, up until from 2012 to about 2014 we went through a, a massive boom period because everybody was feeling confident in the market again and i rode on that do you still have that property yet today yes i'm gonna keep that <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of my trophy my okay. trophy property <laughs> Just one question: How much is it worth today? Then? <laughs> oh no! See, it's dropped. It's only worth three forty at the moment. Okay. Yeah. So it went <laughs> through that we, boom. It will pick up again. <laughs> uh, I hope so, but it, it, it's fine. I don't need to remortgage that property again. That's not part of my strategy. That one makes quite a nice, healthy for a one bed. It makes a net profit of five hundred and sixty pounds a month. So it's it's perfectly yeah, that, fine. That's that's great. So tell me about your portfolio then. Okay, so my, I have a couple of different strategies. So in my own personal property portfolio, I now have three properties. And the, the reason that I keep it at that size is mainly because it's in my own name and anything bigger now I'd get really taxed heavily on. So I went through a period over the last since moving to New York of looking at what really works and what doesn't and get rid of, getting rid of the properties that, you know, I don't need. That was, that was kind of it. I'm not one of these people who believes that you have to hang on to a property if it doesn't work for you. So I have three. I have two in Bath and I have one in London. So those are the three that are in my own name. They bring in about two and a half thousand to three thousand pounds per month. Right. And the, my, the whole goal of that is to just pay down on those mortgages and keep hold of them because they're a nice little portfolio. I've got um, one more that I would buy. And that's if the property comes up because it would make a nice addition. And that's adjoining to the other two. So I've got a bit of a portfolio strategy around that. Um, and then secondly, I then have the US development side, which I've only started uh, experimenting in in the last 12 months and currently working with my joint venture partner out here we bought a um, multi-family house so it's it was always a house that was split into two we bought it through a foreclosure we are we've just gutted the inside and we're putting two condos back into there but they're going to be really high grade condos so we bought it for $565,000 sell out worst case scenario is 1.375 wow <laughs> so that would be <laughs> you, your first project on in, in every country is like big big <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then wow. um in the UK, and then in the UK, I do some investing with my mum, but that's through a separate company. I have a development firm that actually, up until the point that I moved to New York, we were doing developments and flipping them, and then selling them on. So we would, for example, uh, buy a property that had three stories and put a fourth floor on the top and flip it and sell it on. Um, that was kind of that business strategy. But I've, I stopped doing that to kind of. I'm actually going to start doing that again. But that was another one of the strategies. And then on top of that, I do lend some money on other investors' projects at a certain interest rate. So I believe that for me at the moment, because I am still quite young, I don't need to be necessarily settling for a certain amount of properties and sitting on them. I quite enjoy seeing what comes up and jumping on the deal when I find it exciting. That's my investment strategy right now. Mm, interesting <laughs> it seems like you like uh, you like your job mm -hmm. and uh, you got the passive income and then you have your firm and yeah. you have the one with the with lecture yeah you're, you're in a really sweet spot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I really enjoy it and it's taken a long time yeah. for me to get into this zone where I do enjoy it because you know, I, I was having to pull, I still do pull long hours, but all the hours that I do now are on my time, not somebody else's. And that has been what I aimed 
to get to and that's what I love about what's going on now so I'm just excited by the opportunities that are presented to me and I know full well if I wouldn't do something do you know I know what's right I know what's wrong and I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole this episode would be really good because you're a surveyor you you invest from abroad like we do the Swedish listeners uh, so I thought we should ask you some questions that we should think about, if that's all right with you, course, Natasha. Of course, let's do it. First of all, people that may be listening in or don't know what a surveyor is, could you just explain what it is? Surveyor is such a wide, encompassing term, <laughs> but essentially they are a... If they are a chartered surveyor, they are a regulated property professional, but there are 37 disciplines, I think, of being a surveyor. So we specialise or we become chartered in our own specialist areas, depending upon what we focus on when we're training. So Mm. there's, I mean, there's loads, there's loads of different ones and most people would know the building surveyor or the valuation surveyor that tends to be the regular one whereas a where a building surveyor would come out and survey your home or the property that you're buying and giving you information on you know where there's defects or they would put in place a schedule of works and say this is what you need to do this is how much it's going to cost Um, a valuation surveyor does what they say and it says on the tin they value your property and um, I am a commercial surveyor well that's that's the where I uh, did my training I did 75% commercial and 25% residential and what I do and what I qualified in was lease advisory so reading leases interpreting it and putting the strategy in place around it um, property man- property and asset management and also um, the strategic real estate consultancy so that's that's my area that I work in mm, okay so so what's the difference from a valuer and a rig surveyor or is 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 that the same or yeah because it, it's the same right it's the same so uh, valuers definitely have to be RICS regulated but all chartered surveyors would be an RICS regulated surveyor. And to get that, you need to have a license, right? Yes. So if you are going to be a valuer, you have to go through an additional qualification, which requires you to have a certain amount of time in practice um, doing valuations. And it's, there's very stringent t- checks because obviously being a valuer, there's a lot that you have to take into account to make sure that you're protecting your client's position because after all there's a huge difference between valuing something at £500,000 and valuing something at £600,000 because that has a complete um, a, a complete impact on your portfolio worth and what a bank will lend and what a valuer doesn't want to do is say that a property is worth X amount and then the banks go, well, actually it wasn't and then the banks sue them. So valuers have to be very skilled in placing values on property. Uh, a lot of uh, investors use a surveyor before they buy the property yep. and then they use the surveyor afterwards and then they some even go so far so they use the mortgage uh, lender surveyor after they've done the two survey what is the difference okay why can it sometimes be that the mortgage lenders surveyor may be valued lower or higher and the surveyor that you appointed through your own value it maybe less or higher could you explain that maybe yes yeah and and this is not a hard and fast rule because of course every property is in a different situation um so If you have hired your own valuation surveyor, they will be going out and on your behalf and checking what market value is on the day of the valuation, because that is the only day that you can get market value. So say today, 28th of May, 2020, a valuation surveyor went out on my behalf and did a valuation as of today's date. That would just be looking at all the comparables, 
all the market knowledge that they had and just giving me a value based on that. Valuers who are valuing for banks sometimes look at this differently. And I don't know if anybody has seen their bank, the valuation for the bank, but you will have a 90 day valuation, 120 day valuation and 180 day valuation. And have a look closely if you ever see your bank's valuation. And what this is, is this is saying, how much would I get on the open market if the property was marketed for 90 days? And if I had to resell it in 90 days, what would the value of that be? Now, maybe I could actually wait 120 days. So what would the value be if I could wait to sell the property in 120 days? And that would probably be the higher value. And then 180 days, well, that would probably be a slightly higher value again because you'd be waiting for more market players. And so different banks have different risk appetites and they will look at different valuations depending on their risk appetite, but uh, tends to be a, a valuation surveyor who's acting on behalf of the bank will give them that range of values. Usually they would just go for the regular market value, right? So you'd have market value as well in there that your surveyor would do for you. Um, but depending on the bank's risk profile depends upon what they're going to lend to you on. So um, that is why if you get a valuation and the bank, the, the bank value isn't um, doesn't come back at the value that you want, either you renegotiate on the property price or you go and find a different bank. Mm, okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? So that, that yeah, so that's the solution. Um, yes, I mean, when I, I last bought a property in, uh, in November, no? Yes, well, the valuation went through in November, um, and actually the whole thing completed in February. Um, and they, the, but I had agreed a purchase price of £270,000 and the bank came back to me and said, no, we're only going to lend to you £260,000. And I chanced my arm. So I said to the, the seller, look, the bank's valued it at this, sent the seller the valuation and said, that's as much as I can... Um, purchase the property for take it or leave it and they sold it to me for the lower price <laughs> but that that again oh. was just a that was a funny valuer because I own the flat below as well and the flat below the week before had been valued at 300,000 pounds and they're the same floor plate and I got a remortgage on the 300,000 pounds right yeah, yeah, I, I remember that episode. I listened, I listened to it. I remember <laughs> you you were so pissed off. Yeah. You went to your broker and etc. <laughs> so angry about it. Nat Natasha went bananas. <laughs> <laughs> I was having a rant. If you <laughs> yeah, you were you were like Britney Spears cutting your hair off. <laughs> <laughs> No, but what is the best solution then? Should should uh, investors take a 90 day or should they take the 120 or the 180? Always go uh, on worst case scenario. The best, the best tip of advice I can give you, and I don't know if you've explored, have you explored the land registry um, database? Yeah. So you've been, you've been on that, you can see. I don't. Yeah, I, I've been there. I don't know if the listeners have, but okay. I've, I've been there. So it's landregistry.data.gov.uk. And what you should do is over the last six months, search for all the properties that have sold within 0.25 mile radius or um, something like 0.3 kilometers of your subject property. Then have a look at what the range of prices are and always assume that the banks are probably going to go worst case scenario. So say, so we're in, we're at the end of May. So I would look at all of the sold properties since the start of the year. And because we're in COVID, you might want to go back a, a little bit. So you might want to go back to the final three months of uh, 2019 and just have a look at the range of property prices. And probably... What you should then estimate on, estimate on like the lowest 
value that you've got there. And if, you know what, if the bank comes in at best than that, fabulous. But if you can get your deal to work at that worst case scenario, then you probably know that you've got a deal. So let's say if, uh, because this was a really good point that you mentioned, let's say if they haven't been sold a property for maybe five years, three years or 10 years, what do you go on then? Okay, so I would look at surrounding streets. So what I tend to do is I have Google Street View open in one tab and I have um, the HM the HM Land Registry search open on the, the other tab, and then I have Right Move opened in the th- in the third tab. And so what I do <laughs> is I do Street View around, and you can you will be able to see if there's any agency boards outside or what's sold. Um, the other thing is that Right Move do do sold price values, so you want to double check between Right Move and what it says on. Um, land registry and I Mm. have a look within that that radius that that 0.25 mile radius so it might not be the same street but it might be around the corner it might be a little bit further away and I have a look at what what is going on what are this what are similar properties to the one that I'm looking to buy or my clients looking to buy what what is the transactional value of those properties and then I try and google that property and see if there's any pictures of what it looked like when it was sold just so that I can compare and yes okay it's not an exact science any valuer who goes out will have far more knowledge about the area than you will but it's a really good starting place to give yourself an indicator of what it look what the value is of that property really yeah and when when you do the comparisons you then use let's say if it's a terrace house you you have bought you look at terrace house right yes. you don't you don't look at flats so no. semi detached no 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 okay look like for like yeah i've heard this i don't remember who said it but it was someone who said that they called on a surveyor or a valuer the the valuer came and the valuer wasn't even from the the area they were like maybe let's say if uh, you invest in newcastle and the valuer came from london and <laughs> they gave them a very low is that common that the valuer come from uh, a di- different cities or no it's not but some of the companies that go out and value like countrywide connells the big firms they will have databases of comparable evidence which is far better than land registry because they're not just looking at sold prices they are looking at what what their lenders have valued based upon other other transactions right so what other mortgages have been given so they have access to all of this information um and that database will be something that these big firms of surveyors have been putting together over months, years, weeks. So what what's then happening is they're just sending someone with a good pair of eyes to go and have a look around, and then they slot it into what what properties does this look like? Now, you may then unfortunately have chosen a bank which says we're going to lend based upon the 90 day value rather than market value. You know, that's, that's completely out of the surveyor's control. That's not there that that's, they've given all of the information possible to the bank, the bank then risk assesses it and they make a decision of what the value is and what they'll lend on it. So what things does a surveyor look for beside that? Condition, um, where it's located is it on what you know is it on a noisy street is it desirable area is it in school catchment zones you know they take everything into account what's the market sentiment for the area that's something that they really look at you know and also how well will this property let and that's something that they do for the HMOs definitely if you're buying a HMO they don't necessarily value it based upon um, other market comparables, they just value based upon the value of other HMOs. 
So there's, you know, mm. they they really take each individual property into account and they look at everything. Do they contact the letting agent for see what the rent goes or do they have that already? Yep, they contact letting agents, other local agents, other valuers, other lenders, local solicitors. Yep, they contact everybody. They will have a, a, a database of people because they don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. Can they lose their license if they get it wrong? Uh no, so all surveyors have professional indem indemnity insurance and if they get it wrong, the banks will sue them and then potentially they could lose their business because they've been sued a huge amount of money. So how, how can we as a investor not get caught off on, you know, avoid low valuation? What should we do? Decide that you said that you go on right move and street, uh, street, uh, Google Street and quarter mile, was it right? Yeah. And comparing all of this, what can we as an investor do? Make sure that you're not overpaying on a property. You have to, you have to negotiate a really, really good deal on a property. And you should always be trying to negotiate a good deal on a property. Um, that's that's your job as the investor you go into negotiation and you get the best possible price you can for that property that's the only way that you are going to be able to make sure that the valuer agrees with your value with what you're paying and can you give some tips on how to always get a high valuation then <laughs> oh, <laughs> like so... the one that you got in in nothing <laughs> oh my gosh that's that but that's just that's just the market the market moved the market really exploded. Um, so that was investing at the right time. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to, everything that you do is in the purchase price. So you have to be buying at a good price. And a good price is looking at, say I've looked and I see that comparables have sold, like the highest sale value is £125,000. Well, I know that if I've negotiated at £105,000, that's a great deal. You know, yeah. so, so you've, you've got to be looking at the extent of the market and always trying to be negotiating at the lower end of the market. That's the, that's the only so way the because then when you get the revaluation, you know that you've already got, you've made money in there. So, so I, I think, think you're already, already covered, covered this, but, but I'm still going to ask it because we never know. Maybe you can pop up something <laughs> more. <laughs> so what comparables do surveyor use? So recent sold values, they also look at any uh, remortgages and those, those valuations. That is um, mainly if you're just buying simple buy to lets you know you buy it you put one family in there uh, that's that's the general rule of thumb for commercial property it's rental value they look at rental value as a way of valuing the property because you capitalize on the yield and so that's a different method of valuation and then if you are if you've got a hmo the the myth is that all hmos are valued on a commercial valuation that doesn't actually happen what tends to happen if you are in an area where there are a high number of HMOs, your HMO will be compared to the value of other HMOs. So again, different, different methods, but it's always local transactions, so mainly sales. Okay, okay. So should you always use a surveyor? Uh, yes, I would recommend that you always get a building survey done before you purchase anything. But you don't necessarily need to have a valuation done because the bank's going to do that and you're going to pay the bank for the privilege of them getting this, the valuation done for you anyway. So yes to a building surveyor, not necessarily to your own valuation surveyor. Let the bank do that. Yeah. And let's say if you're doing a flip, then you you use uh, the estate agent, right? Um, or would you use a surveyor there when you're selling it? No, use, a, use an estate agent because they're going to give you a rough guide price of what they think you're going to be able to get. What things should we as investors keep an extra eye at in the report that the surveyor valuer provide? Um, just have a look at the condition. If there's more often than not, they say the reason why they think the value is less. 
So use that. Use that in your negotiations. If you if you think you're paying too much for a property, well, have a look at um, what it says in the valuation report and use that as part of your negotiation tactics. And it might say, mm -hmm. you know, low ceiling height or this isn't fire safe or whatever it is, but just use that as part of your negotiation tactics to negotiate a discount. Where do you add value as a investor in a property where do you get most value oh from adding adding value to it um mm. so usually just by making it look modern clean tidy like very um very almost Instagram worthy, but not as much decoration. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That, that's normally how you can um, improve the value. If, if it's worth improving the value, I think the myth is yeah. that you can do that to every property and you can get huge amounts of increase in value. It's not necessarily correct. So just make sure that you're looking at the difference between how much it costs to do that versus actually how much the increase in price is because if you're not going to get the increase in value out of the property don't spend the money you know do you can do something a lot cheaper and still make it look really nice um, for commercial property the increase in value comes from increasing the rent and getting a better quality tenant so that those are very mm -hmm. two very different things so the lease and how you structure the lease for commercial is what brings the value for residential it's having a really you know a really nice looking property and yeah if you it's here's the thing if you can add to the property if you can add on the side or you can go up a level and that's going to be cheaper than the increase in value do it but if it's not going to add anything then there's no point in doing it you might as well just sit and wait for the market okay so there's no specific areas you should focus on like some say uh, the kitchen uh, and the bathroom that's where you make your money if you have a nice kitchen and if you have a nice bathroom but everything else is like yeah they don't care is that true or is it not well, true <laughs> i would i would always provide my my tenants with a nice kitchen nice bathroom that's kind of a given um but you don't need to spend over the odds on it because yeah. it's not worth it. I mean, you could do a nice kitchen for £3,000. You could do a nice bathroom for £2,000. You spent £5,000. Well, the £5,000 was worth spending because you get a tenant in quicker. Yeah. I was just thinking more like, let's say if uh, you have uh, like gold taps <laughs> on, <laughs> on, on the bath and then uh, in regular if the value are, we're like, oh, okay, because it's gold and it's, you know, it's a bath or it's a shower, you get more or they don't mind. No, or no. They no, don't no, mind. No, no. <laughs> it doesn't get taken into account. <laughs> so don't be putting gold taps in your bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I went, I went MTV Cribs. <laughs> 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 so uh, there's been a lot of virtual viewings what's your take on it uh virtual viewings are great here's here's how you should use them this is my tactics this is my tactics with my clients do the virtual viewing if you like the property put in an offer right simple as but always say that the offer is subject to viewing the property because what tends to happen is you then go and view the property and the viewing has accidentally covered up that the ceiling's not coming down or has, you know, it's, it's omitted to show you the whole truth. So, but this, the, the, the beauty of this is that you do the virtual viewing and say the property is on the market for £200,000, but I have done my deal analysis and I think that £170,000 is the maximum that I will pay for it. I then say to mm -hmm. the agent, I will pay you £170,000 for this property, subject to me viewing the property and everything being okay. At that point, they go to their client and say, hey, we've got an offer for £170,000. Do you want to provisionally accept it? Yes or no? If they say no, what have you lost? Five minutes of your time doing a virtual viewing. That's it. 
five minutes, one email, that's all you've lost. But if they say yes, you've then got a fabulous deal that you can now go and have a look at or send someone, send someone like a viewer to go and have a look at this property, actually take all the pictures that you need because you've employed someone to work on your behalf. So they're going to go and have a look at everything. You can even send in a building surveyor if you want to spend a little bit of money on it. And then based upon yeah. that, you either think, oh gosh, I've got a freaking good offer here. I've got a good deal. I'm going to go forward with it. Or you think, no, actually I need to renegotiate on the price. But that for me is really good because previously it was much harder to put an offer on a property that you'd not seen. So do you use uh, Viewer yeah. or, do, or do, uh, you, you have used it before Viewer? Yes. And are you happy with it? Yeah, they. Um, I mean, it's as detailed as you want it to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I've I've heard mixed mix. Some say it's great. Some say now nah, it's crap. <laughs> well, it's never going to be as good as you seeing it with your own eyes. Yeah. But did you did you use the viewer and then you put in a structural uh, surveyor or something to go and check it? Yeah, but after you've agreed the price. There's no, yeah. you know, you, okay. you want to know that you've got something for a good price before you spend money on a building surveyor. I've thought about using the viewer, but I, I got a, a, fr- a friend of mine go and check it out. And then he's a builder as well. So I thought like, okay, it's better that he checked than maybe someone from Uber. But definitely, <laughs> that's, a, that's a definitely good tip. And what's your take? You need to do yeah. the uh, thirty pound flights return. Not right now, obviously, but when when everything opens again, it's cheaper for you to get on a flight return for a day, isn't it, than hire a viewer? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I don't know the prices. What well, what do they take, viewer? I think it's eighty pounds to one hundred and twenty. If you can get if you can get a return wow. flight for thirty pounds, why not? Go have a look. Definitely, I I agree. That's cheaper. I thought it was like maybe. 20 pounds or something no, but because yeah, they they're, write, they're ex- well the reports that they write are massive you get a 20 to 30 page report on your property wow oh yeah it's detailed that's great that's great yeah i might use them in the future who knows who's no who knows and what what's your take on the desktop valuation then mm, well <laughs> if they have all if they have all the comparable evidence then fine do you know i i i, I I think a surveyor will only do a desktop valuation if they feel confident in their value. Otherwise, they'll decline to do the valuation, which is why banks are so slow at the moment at lending. It's because not all properties valuers would want to value. So I would be reasonably comfortable if a bank did a desktop valuation because I would think, well, that surveyor has agreed to do the valuation and they're com- confident in the value that they've given the bank. So that would be my take on it. Have you heard of anyone who got like higher than the top? Because I haven't heard anyone say, oh, yeah, I got higher or I got the price that I wanted through desktop valuation. Have I heard of that? No. Um, usually you don't. Usually they're not going to give you a higher price, actually. I, very rare would they give you a higher price than the amount that they've agreed that you've agreed to buy a property for just because yeah that um that protects themselves it'd be very rare unless you're doing um bridging to long-term lending in which case the bank would probably give you a higher value because they're going to remortgage out of your bridging onto the long-term lending option but apart from that no they, they wouldn't do it there, there would be no point it'd be too risky yeah that's true how is it to invest remotely compared to when you were in the UK and you could do everything by your own? Um, not that different. I have a very good team who looks after my properties and they do everything on site. I'm not a contractor. Um, I might be able to change light bulb and I might be able to do a little bit of handyman stuff, but it's not my bread and butter. So I have always been an investor who systemizes everything and sits behind her desk i run everything off of excel i do spreadsheets galore before i buy something but i never ever been the first person to go and view a property in fact two of my properties i didn't even see before the day that i completed on them my mom went and saw them and was like you have to buy this so i it's not much different and i don't um i have very good systems in place and 
because of that, I don't really think about it. Okay, so may you want to maybe share your systems? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so I have a spreadsheet which I run everything off of and I call it my master spreadsheet and that has all of my contractors, all of my property managers, um, all of my mortgage information um, and all of my account details. Then I have my MacBook and I have Skype on my MacBook which has a London phone number and that is how I run the day-to-day -day management of my property portfolio. Then I do my deal analysis. I've got a deal analysis spreadsheet. And all I do is every time I see a property that catches my eyes, I run the numbers on the deal analysis spreadsheet. If they work, then I phone up the agent and we go through the process as normal. I ask them if they could do a guided tour. If they can't, I get one of my contacts to go and do it or my business partner or my mom, she's got a good eye for these things. And I just get them to go and have a quick look round. And then from there, um, you just instruct people as normal. So I'd instruct the building surveyor to go and have a look. And then I've got my solicitor. I'll just say to her, Nishita, we're buying another property. Here you go. Um, <laughs> you, you know, it's really, it's very, very simple. The only thing that you have to make sure is that once in a while you're in the UK to give everybody your up-to-date passport details or your driving license or just proof of address so that they've got that all for money laundering regulations. But apart from that, short of seeing the property, everything else, you would run like a regular purchase. So when you mean guided tour, do you mean uh, that the person that you send, they will go and check it? Or do you mean that uh, the estate agent will do and film the apartment? Sometimes or... they will. And sometimes I will get someone to go out and look at it on my behalf. Okay, okay. So it's about having a good team around you. People that you know that are going to go out and do the right... You know, they're going to look at things. They're going to act on your behalf. And that is so 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 important that for me yeah. is more important than viewing a property because i know that my team would say hold up we're not doing this you know yeah. it's, too, it's too difficult and once it goes once we've got the building survey and it goes through legals at that point that's going to flag to me if this is going to be a difficult property yeah, I really hope that you have all of these spreadsheets on uh, their cloud based. <laughs> they are. Everything I do is everything I do is cl is cloud based. Um, if you want my master spreadsheet, you're more than welcome to go and pick that up from my. Uh, this that's the freebie that I'm offering on my website at the moment. So if you'd like that, Whoa. you're more than welcome to. Yep. <laughs> All the listeners, go and pick it up. It's free before we return to 1997. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is the freebie. Um, so, yeah. So that's, it. that's essentially how I do it. I keep it very simple. There's nothing really uh, complicated about it because I have, so I have so much else to run that I don't think I could be complicated in this. So yeah. keep it simple. Keep it simple, yeah. So what tips can you give us from Sweden that we should, uh, beside your great system that you mentioned, but what should we like look out for or think about when we're investing from abroad? Okay, first off is the cheaper the interest rate you can get, the better. So uh, for you guys who are investing who aren't uh, British residents, your very first point of call is finding a lender if you if you need a lender if you're buying cash then fabulous but if you do need a lender that for me is the first thing that you would need to do to make sure that you're getting low interest rates and really as an overseas investor you've got you I would hope that you'd be looking at around five percent um, yeah and that could be worse than that I don't know what your experience is of interest rates between five and seven and if the property is valued more than hundred thousand you can get rates around uh, 3.45 so it took me a very long time like a year to get a hold of all of these brokers because it's a jungle of brokers out there and 
sometimes when you talk with them, they think you're an expat when you're clearly saying you're from Sweden and you have a Swedish passport, but they they don't seem to listen. So it took a while. So it's like you say, if you get around 5%, you should be happy. Yeah. So if you get that finance in place first and you know you've got a lender, ask the lender what their criteria is, because again, it's different for people who are living outside of the the country than it is for people who are living in the country and then set your goals what are you looking for that's so important because otherwise you get overwhelmed with a barrage of people just sending you deals and this that and the other and you don't need it you don't need it you need to say look I would like to buy a property for £150,000 that property has to be bringing in at least £750 to £850 per calendar month that is that and then they can find you those properties or you can look out for those properties and then once you've found a property that that works for or you could negotiate on always look at you know what what price would be the ideal price the best case price and what is the worst case price start your negotiation at, at best case, best case price and then just see what happens and then from there you agree an offer fantastic get your building surveyor out put it into solicitor's hands that is really where i would start for anybody investing from sweden finance first make sure you've got those people on your team and then set your goals and look at property based upon that great tips really great tips so i think we've come to the fun part (laughs) this this part i love i love it because every guest that i have always vary to what they like so tell me your favorite tv series or netflix or whatever hbo series that you look at okay so i have just finished watching white lines on netflix and i was gripped and it was it's only and what's it about it's uh, about a woman who um whose brother died in Ibiza and she goes back to try and find him. And I I was ah. really gripped with it. I just, I spent the last weekend just watching all 10 episodes. So that's the most recent thing that I've watched on Netflix. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen it and I was like, oh, maybe can I look at it? Uh, I, I looked at the this uh, Michael Jordan, The Last Dance, that was so epic you need to see it if you haven't seen it either. i'm going to oh i that's on my to watch list <laughs> and what about film movie film what do i what have i watched so this is this is kind of this is more of a documentary but i loved michelle obama's becoming yeah people say that one is great is, is it good fantastic and if you've read the book it's different to the book no i haven't what's the difference then i have well one is more about her backstory and one is very much about um, you know what she does today and all of the the lovely work and charity work that she does she's so inspiring I loved it I loved it if you've got an hour and a half to watch becoming do watch it so is she like the new uh, lady Diana yes seems that seems like it my mom she cried so much when she said, she's not even your queen no but you were so fantastic <laughs> oh okay yeah i was small so i don't know so <laughs> i was young <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't remember what, that very well <laughs> and what about book then um i am I've just read a book called The Source by Tara Swart, which I really enjoyed. It's it's about how you manifest your life and different mindset around that. Um, I'm currently reading, is it called something about Millionaire Mindset by Harv T. Ecker? Mm, yeah, Millionaire Mindset. Is that is that your favorite book? Which which is your favorite book? Oh no, actually one of one of the, my favorite books is Everything Is Figure Outable by Marie Folio. Mm-hmm. What's that about? So it's it's about how to how to figure stuff out in your life when you're feeling stuck, how to move forward, what to do next, and it starts with the really small steps. And I keep that book just above my desk so that I can always see it. Whenever I'm feeling stuck or like I don't know what to do, I 
have a quick flick through everything that's figure outable and start at a new chapter and I get so many ideas about what to do next how can I make that next step how can I not be afraid of making that next step and it's incredibly helpful wow I need to cop that book then <laughs> <laughs> it's great <laughs> oh it's been great speaking with you um it's been this has been a fantastic podcast I mean, how, yes. are you, how are you guys finding it in Sweden? How do you find it when you look at the UK property market at the moment? Uh, at the moment, so we have bid on two properties, but uh, <laughs> this was quite funny. The, the vendor <laughs> said, like, if you're going to give me silly offers, don't mind. And it wasn't silly offer because the the property he put it out for 120 mm -hmm. and on that street done up pre-corona is 120 and his uh, house is like destroyed it's old and the kitchen is crap you need to have a new bath everything it's it's so bad i hope he doesn't listen now <laughs> but <laughs> But is yeah, and he still wanted to have uh, market value. What he said, and I was like, okay, let's send the builder there. He can go on a viewing. He went on a viewing, and then he came back with the with the quote. And then I told him, I cannot give you more than sixty seven. Oh. <laughs> and, <he was like, laughs> and he was like, no, I want at least one ten. And I was like, okay, good luck then. And then I asked him if, if, if he owned the property own right or if it was on a, and then he said it was own right because it was his dad pro, uh, property before, before, because before he died. So he just want to maximize the amount from the house. Fine. Well, yeah. leave it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I, my missus was like, just leave it, leave him alone. He will, he will, he will either either come around, or he will uh, lower his bid. Maybe he will get it sold for eighty thousand, but one twenty never. No, no. Well, you never know what's going to happen in the next coming months. He might desperately need that sixty-seven thousand pounds, and then he gets back in contact with you. Yeah. And how do you? How are you uh, feeling this? Everything that's going on right now. I think are you purchasing or are you holding back or do you have anything in the pipeline I must admit one of my biggest things that I've done since COVID was uh, fight fires for my clients and make sure that everybody had all of their property portfolio let and that's been what I've been focusing on now I um should I t I'll tell you this but don't go after the properties that I'm looking at Nana I see you um <laughs> there, was a, there was an auction today there's an auction today and I don't know about you but I um go back through auction catalogs and anything that's not sold I try and put lowball offers on and just see what happens ah uh, you cheeky yeah <laughs> <laughs> so there was an auction today on all sorts so that's what I was going to do I haven't had time to do that prior to um covid starting so mm. that's that's kind of I'm I'm starting to look again. I would actually like to invest in some mixed use because I know that my development partner in the UK has been chomping at the bit to buy commercial ground residential uppers, and I I really would like to do that too. I've just I up until today have just been so consumed by helping everybody else get their property portfolios fully let, and thank goodness, touch wood, mine's been let, and I've I've been perfectly like okay with it. Um, so uh, this is me in the first week of just having a look again at what's out there. But from experience from my clients, what we're finding is, is that sellers aren't really taking offers. And so... Yeah, it seems like that. Yeah, it's, it's not. I think the market will get softer over the next couple of months. But right now it's a pain to get discounted offers. Yeah, that's what I feel as well. But can you do you think it's because of the, the all the grants that the yeah. governments are giving or left and right? Yeah. That's why people are like, nah, I'm going to chill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I have money in my bank. I don't need yours. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. But anyway, I I am going to now start looking again. So yeah, watch, yeah. watch this space. You can all, everybody can follow my lead on the auction house and be outbidding each other after auction. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> this is like off topic a bit yep. what do you think will happen after corona oh i think that people will be looking for far more live work play stuff so if you've got a house that can accommodate an office that's going to be so great do you know what? people are going to be looking for it an office with a garden so that as people work from home more they've got that opportunity i think that's how things yeah. are going to change I always ask people that what their uh, opinion is about it, and it's always mixed. Some say like like you say, some say back to normal, and some say something else. It's always interesting to ask that question. <laughs> I think things will change. The commercial property market's definitely got to change. I don't think that's a bad thing. It's been needed to be changed for a while because our high streets are really failing, so we have to do something else, else to perk them up. I think property-wise, the one thing that that obviously will keep the market strong right now is the fact that interest rates are so low. So at the first time buyer end of the market, if if you're a first time buyer in the UK right now, you don't have to pay stamp duty. You can get dirt cheap interest rates. You can borrow 90% and you're now looking to, for a home that's probably further outside the city if you're if you work in an office job so that you can have that office so that's going to bring the bottom end of the market up for sure that's going to increase those price rises because the barriers to entry for first-time buyers are so low right now so do you really think people should maybe start doing flips then no if you're like saying like <laughs> the, the problem with flips is that you can't right now estimate what the end value what is going happen. to be. Yeah, that's the only yeah. risk available for that. I mean, sure, if you can, if there's a property at ninety thousand pounds and you're buying it for fifty thousand pounds, then I guess give it a punt. That's not me giving evaluation advice. That's like, okay, we'll take a risk. <laughs> but if I, I I personally am not going to be doing that right now because um, it's very difficult to get some of the things that you need for construction at the moment. So you do, and also uh, the health and safety for construction sites in the UK is going to change. So even on your developments, if you've got a contractor in there, they have to be running at fifty percent occupancy, fifteen uh, percent. Sorry, fifty percent of of uh, people are allowed to be on site so that means that your project is going to take twice as long which would probably impact upon your profit so I don't know whether right now I'm going to really want to do that so definitely that that as that flattens out and we see that as our, our normal I'm sure it'll be easier but right now but it's not really something that I would look at as 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 favorably as potentially just buying to hold and just letting it out. Yeah, that's a good point. So you hear, listeners? <laughs> yeah, we just need just need to be aware of the fact that okay, fine, you've got a deal, but does that deal still stack up if instead of turning something around in three months, it now is going to take six to nine months? Does it work? I guess you yeah. you will know if you've done your deal analysis. That's true. So I want to thank you very much for taking your time to giving the listeners and especially me all of the information and your funny story about <laughs> the, nothing here. <laughs> here, some listeners you should listen definitely to and see what is the NC Property Invest the NC Podcast. NC podcast, yeah. yeah, yeah, and you have a, a Facebook group that is awesome as well. Yeah, and Natasha is totally awesome. I like her, I follow her, and all the listeners, you should as well because she's very funny, especially when she get her breakdown. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's quite, <laughs> yeah, so. How, if people would like to reach out to you, how can they reach out to you on social media, email, your number, your Skype number, <laughs> your... 
<laughs> my dress. You'll see what... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Um, you can find my podcast, which is the NC podcast. You can find my Facebook group, which is Property Investment Mastery. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter, which is at Natasha C. Collins. You can email me if you'd like to, natasha at ncrealestate.co.uk. And for all of that information, head on over to ncrealestate.co.uk, which when you go to that website, a pop-up will pop up and you can have the master spreadsheet that i was talking about earlier i'm gonna cop it <laughs> <laughs> go get it go get it okay then thank you very much and don't be stressed invest people <laughs> <laughs> bye bye